Hey, welcome back to the Bad Hombres podcast. I have here financial advisor extraordinaire, Angelo, usual suspect, Mr. Carlo, public baby daddy. What's going on, everybody? How's good? How's everybody doing today? Yeah, it's a bit of a Carlo, why are you so quiet uh, today? We're kicking it in. I'm just expecting a guest, so I'm just trying to listen if they're arriving or not. See, he's got something. Okay, something okay. Yeah. Yeah, he does. He does. Well, today's um, today's podcast is about. Okay, I think. I think, I think there's a lot of to reading books every day and to listen to audio books every day. Um, Sorry, someone's giving me a lot of feedback. I think it's yes. Hello, yeah. So there's a lot of value into listening to audiobooks, listening to reading books, especially self. I've been doing this for the last, I want to say, seven to eight years. Uh, every month, I try to read one or two books, but every one or two that's really stand out. It could be the way it was written that really resonated with me and it could be just the materials i think angelo and carlo are guys that are always reading books and i'm curious to know their top five personal development books so, well, i guess i'm going first angelo tell me sure. tell me about your, your top five yes well, sir. top five um you know, some, some books I really, I've enjoyed over the years, uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. That was a book that, you know, opened my eyes to a lot of things. And, um, you know, especially the whole theory around 10,000 hours. Uh, Freakonomics is one that I've really enjoyed, uh, which really talks about how, you know, it's not always about dollars and cents, but environment and common sense factors into those things. And I got a few examples for you. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Chris Voss and his book, Never Split the Difference, really changed, you know, the way I was, the way I think. And, and yes, you know, that's, that's that one. I mean, if you're going to take any from my list of five, that's the one you're going to read first. Um, you know, my younger years, how to win friends, friends. And what is it? People. What is it about? Uh, I'll give you my number five. And what is it? Five, never split the uh, difference that, that hit home with you. Well, with never split the difference, it talks about, you know, the premise around the book is that, you know, a lot of times people like to do what's fair and or what they deem is fair. Uh, and they, you know, when it comes to negotiating, you know, they they do what's um, not always in their best interest but they try and sort of keep the peace. So for example, if you were selling me something for a hundred bucks and I offered you 50, you know, human nature is like, ah, let's just split the difference. Well, I didn't really want to pay 75 and you didn't want to give it away for 75, but because of the emotion around the negotiation, you know, people will tend to do that. And both people walk away feeling like they've lost. Whereas, you know, Chris Voss was an FBI agent who mm -hmm. was, um, you know, in charge of uh, terrorist negotiation. And, you know, in the, in the right at the beginning of the book, he talks about, well, how do you split a human mm -hmm. life? You can't say, well, give me the left half and keep the right half. And, you know, we'll call it a day. Right. When you've got a when you've got a terrorist situation or, or a hostage situation, excuse yeah. me, um, you know, you either give the the you either get the hostage back alive or you get the hostage back dead. And, you know, the goal is to get the hostage back alive without succumbing to the wants and, and outrageous you know, um, requests of the, of the kidnappers, right? Because if you keep cowering the kidnappers, he says, you're just going to keep encouraging more people to do it. Right. So it, it talks a lot about in the art of negotiation, how to really figure out what, you know, the person you're negotiating with really wants and what's really important to them. So it just, it's just a, it's a great, I, I listened to it twice in the car back to back and just, you know, every now and again, I'll, I'll pick it back up and, you know, a chapter here, a chapter there. And it just, it really helps fine tune just sort of my thought process around, you know, understanding that, yeah, it is a win-win situation when you negotiate and, you know, whether it's you're in sales or you're negotiating the price of your house or, or whatever, 
you know, and in, in, in the in the financial side, if you're putting a spin on it, right, you, you really should never split the difference, right? We talked about in the last podcast, buying that retirement and making sure that you put enough money away. So when you pull the trigger and you retire, yeah. that money is paying you what you want it to pay you. You know, and if you don't quite get there, you're not like, well, it's, you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll make do. No, man, you don't split the difference with certain things in life. And and to me, your retirement is one thing you never split the difference on. Damn. That's powerful, bro. That's powerful. I was actually going to, I have three books before I read the, um, the never split the difference book. Um, I have three that I want to read first. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's definitely one of, one of my the books that I want to read. What, what are the other ones you were talking about how to win friends and influence people? Yeah. You know, Dale Carnegie's book, how to win friends and influence people. I read that in my early twenties, late teens, and it just gives insight on, you know, just some of the differences between human, human nature and, you know, how to, you know, how to, how, you know, the idea that not everyone's the same, right? We have extroverts, we have introverts, we have, you know, people who are really mm -hmm. open and they wear their heart on their sleeve where other people are tied to the chest. And, and it's just, it's the idea of, of how do you, how do you integrate into certain groups of people? And, um, you know, as a, as a person who was in sales, you know, that's definitely a book I, I wanted to read. And, um, that was a big one for me. Also, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. You know, when I moved into more a sales manager role or a coaching role, um, learning that, you know, starting to learn the differences mm -hmm. between how men are wired and women are wired. That's a good one. I know it's a bit of an archaic one, but there's still some good content that's relevant in that one. Um, yeah. So, so from a business perspective, you know, I'd recommend those two. Uh, from a personal growth, I would recommend. Never split the difference, outliers, and uh, Freakonomics is a good one if you're into, you know, sort of human psychology. And and I'm a big fan of the backstory, mm. right? I mean, show me the story, but, you know, show me how everybody got there, right? So, you know, uh, Freakonomics, I'll give you one yeah. example. You know, they talk about the, um, the human beings will naturally do what's in their best interest, consciously or subconsciously. Right. And you can you can take that to any area of life, whether it's relationships, business, self growth, raising your kids, whatever. Right. So one example they gave was around real estate agents. And they said, you know, the re for a real estate agent, it's not always um, it's not always in their best interest to get you your best price. Right. And they also found through the studies they did that real estate agents do way better when negotiating their own properties than on yours because it's human nature. And, and let me give you an example. Let's say you have a house and it's a million dollars. I'm making a number up. And on a million dollars, a real estate agent's gonna get 5% commission normally, which is 50 grand, split that with the seller, so two and, you know, 25 grand, and then split that with their brokerage. So let's say they're gonna make between 10 and $15,000 on the sale of that house. OK, now you sit there and you say to an agent, I think I can get one point yeah. one for the house. Right. And the agent's like, yeah, you can probably get a million. Right. And we can sell this quickly. So within a day or two or a weekend or a week, bang, that house is gone. Agent mm -hmm. makes their 10 or 15 grand and off they go. Now, let's say you as the seller go, no, no, no I'm real confident that we can get one point one. So you wait it out. OK, on that extra hundred grand that real estate agent is going to make maybe an extra thousand or fifteen hundred dollars, but it's going to take an extra maybe two weeks or four weeks to close that deal and get you your price. Now for you as the seller, you're oh. making an extra 95 grand, right? That's huge for you. But for the agent, they're like, eh, I make an extra 1500 bucks. So yeah. what? You know, I made 15 on it. What's an extra thousand if I don't have to, to drag it out for, you know, another two, three, four weeks, and maybe we lose the offer, maybe the value goes down, etc. So they talk about how, you know, you've got to advocate for yourself. And you've just got to understand that, you know, the person who's going to have your best interest in mind first is going to be you.
and you have to you have to advocate that way. Gotcha, gotcha, Carlo. What uh, what are your uh, your, your top three? Hey, you know what's you know what's funny, Angelo. Uh, a friend of mine is going through that whole pro process right now. He has the same exact scenario with one of the real estate uh, uh, agents. And I told him, I said, don't don't go with the agent. Stick to what price you want, and and then just roll with it. If they want to stay, they stay, or else you get another real estate agent. You know, you know what's funny, Carlo, with that, if I may. My dad has always had a bit of a shoe when it came to real estate deal. And what he was able to do is when he hires an agent, he basically says to the agent, listen, this is what I want for the property. I don't care what you sell it for. You sell it for whatever you want. At the end of the day, after I pay your fee, after I pay the transfer costs, after I pay all the expenses, I want this much in my bank account. And if you can't get me that price, I'm not selling. So don't come back to me with, oh, but you know, it's a good deal and this and that. I don't need to sell it. I'm not in a rush. I don't care. This is the price I want. If I can't get it, don't sell it. And uh, it's worked out really well for him. So the last conversation he had with the agent, that's what happened, basically. So the agent said... Uh, Oh, I'm not gonna. So it's basically a million dollars. The one the agent wants to put it on, uh, but it's worth 1.3. My buddy is saying pretty much. Okay. The agent now doesn't want to put it on the market. So the agent said to someone else, "I don't want to put the house for, on the market for that much because I'm gonna look back." So my buddy came to find this out, approached the real estate agent, and said basically, basically what you said. This is what I want. This is what you're going to sell it for. If you don't like it, you tell me now. We take your sign off and we get someone else. Totally. And what's interesting to you is, you know, my dad has also said something like this. He said, listen, let's say I want, let's take your buddy's example, right? If it was my dad, he'd say, look, I want 1.3 for this house. I don't care what you sell it. If you sell it for 2 million, you can keep the extra 700. No problem. I don't care what you sell it for. But I want my 1.3 and that's it. So, you know, but it's, but it also depends on your buddy's situation and what he's willing, like how long he's willing to wait, right? Like, is he desperate to sell? Does he need the money? Is he in a situation where he's bought a house and he has to sell so he can move? Or does he not, right? If he's got time and he doesn't care, wait it out. Wait it out till you get what you want, right? As long as it's, as long as it's reasonable though, right, Carlo? Because you don't want to be in a situation where you think your house is worth 1.3 and really it isn't. It's worth 1.1. Yeah. Or you've got like you, this emotional attachment because it's like, oh, you know, like I put this, uh, you know, this stone wall up on my living room and I did it myself. So it's worth an extra 200 grand. People are like, no, it's not. Right. So as long as he's not out to lunch with the price that he wants, he shouldn't be, you know, he shouldn't be roped into selling it if he doesn't want to. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I told him too. So. Yeah. yeah, it's funny you just mentioned that scenario. I was like, "What does this guy know my my buddy or something?" <laughs> it's like chapter two in the book, man. Freakonomics one hundred and one, right? So I'll give you I'll give you another Freakonomics example. So they did a study of crime in the U.S. and they said that with the introduction of crack and cocaine in the '60s, crime skyrocketed in the U.S. in the '60s, '70s, and early '80s, and then by the '90s, crime plummeted. And they couldn't understand why. And of course, you know, the teachers would say, well, it's education. All the money we've put into education, we've worked really hard with the kids, especially like in, in the, in the you know, low poverty areas, the inner city schools, we got better quality teachers. That's why crime's down. You know, and the police force would say, no, no, we've got better technology and better training for officers. And, you know, we're, we're just, we're better at our job 30 years later. That's why crime is down. And then politicians would say, no, 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 it's, it's down because, you know, we put in better policies around crime and, and, and you know, detracted people from, from committing crimes and the, drug, uh, the war against drugs. You know what the real reason was? There was this court case in, 1970, in the 1970s called Roe v. Wade, where the U.S. allowed a woman to get an abortion. Mm. And what was happening was when abortion became legalized, the majority of women that were getting abortions were in lower poverty areas, 
inner cities, right? Low income, low poverty. And that's where the highest crimes were. Well, if those kids can't be born, they can't commit crimes. Hmm. But what's so interesting is that that little ripple effect, that one thing creates such a big ripple effect, but then everybody else started taking credit. Oh, no, it's us. Oh, no, it's us. Oh, no, it's... It had nothing to do with police, education, you know, or or government policy. And I'm sure those things helped. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say they detracted from it, but um, let me tell you, it was Roe v. Wade. And it was such an interesting discovery because it just goes back and talks about human psychology and how, you know, people will take credit for stuff that maybe they had an influence on, maybe they didn't, but chances are they didn't, right? Yeah. So super, super interesting. I love stuff like that. I'll soak that up all day long. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Those are really good insight on um <clears throat> on some of those books, man. I'm definitely definitely getting free economics. So I'm gonna add free economics um after I do the never split the difference. I have three books right now. Um the one I'm reading right now is called uh Your Five Moves Ahead. Um, your, your next five moves, sorry, which is one that Carlos has been trying to tell me to get, uh, Patrick, but David. Um, it's taking me a little bit of time getting into it. I don't know is, if it's the way it was written, but I, I'm, I'm sticking to it. After that, I'm getting a book called Sell It Like Serhant, which is a top real estate um, guru in New York, uh, million dollar listings. I just read his book called Big Money Energy and blow my mind. So um, sell it like Sirhan is good. And then I'm just getting one on uh, Richard Cooper called The Unplugged Alpha, <clears throat> which is just um, just to keep me with my um, process of uh, growing up, getting older, vetting women, uh, and, you know, just all the, the stuff you need. <clears throat> in terms of my top three books, first book that I would recommend for just for personal finance and personal growth it would be the the total money makeover by by their ramsey um because that's an old school principles of money that that will help you for the rest of your life and for the generations that are going to go after you i think i think everybody should learn the five the, the baby steps i think they're great um i think you know, um, what do you call it? Understanding that your, how, how does he say, your most important tool to, for money is your job, your income. Your most powerful tool is your income. And knowing how to use it, how to leverage it, how to save it, um, how, to, how to do all of those things is important. The biggest takeaway and the one that has helped a lot of people with the total money makeover it's is the whole getting out of debt, uh, getting that in your head that unless is unless it's debt which is paid by others like real estate, um, you don't you know you're gonna have to not buy that new TV on your credit card. Cash flow as much things as you can. Um, that's just one of the things I learned. So total money makeover, it's a really good foundation because after the total money makeover for me will be the 10x rule. So the 10x rule, it just teaches you how to think big. You know, instead of you getting a an apartment on the 11th floor, you want to you, you got the apartment, you don't settle for the apartment because you want to go for the penthouse. It's like whatever dreams you have, you mul- you you multiply by 10 and and you take 10 times the action that you that that it takes, you know, um and I think you know, learning how to think big because a lot of people, they sell themselves short. They, they just settle. And the worst thing you could do is settle for, for your situation. I think that's the book. The 10 X rule was the book that I needed to hear when I was working in construction. And I thought that that was it for me. And not that the construction is bad, but there's a difference between construction as to like what Carlo do with car. Carlos like his own company. He's got employees contracts. And then there's the construction that I was doing, which is like $18 an hour <laughs> doing labor. That's a, that's the one I'm think I was saying, you know, uh, <clears throat> so that one just taught me like, well, I don't have to be here. I could either run my company or I could be having my own clients. 
uh, and I just went a different route. I got into sales, but that, you know, learning how to think big was, was pretty good. And the next book that I would recommend would be by 50 cent, which is a book that just came out last year. I think, uh, it's called hassle harder. Uh, the audio book is one of the best because you, you have a guy here that spent a lot of time in the hood, but he spent a lot more time in corporate boardrooms and corporate settings. You know, he's probably done 10 years in the streets and now he's been in the, in the corporate world for 20 years. So it's interesting to learn from a guy who was successful in both environments for a guy who can handle himself in the street, but can handle himself cutting a deal with Coca-Cola for a smart water. I want to know what this guy is doing. And the fact is 50 cent is not going to sit with you for 10 hours and talk to you. But when you're listening to his audiobook for 10 hours, it's essentially the same thing. That's why I like these books, these audiobooks that are read by the authors. Kevin Hart has his own book, um, and it's unbelievable. Matthew McConaughey has a book called Green Lights, and it's one of the most inspirational books I've, I've ever heard. And this is from people that wouldn't even give you 30 seconds of their time, but they they put a lot of their life experiences and they put them in, a, in an audiobook format. And for me, that's worth a lot more than the $15.99 that I pay for it. Like $15.99 for an audiobook of 10 hours of Matthew McConaughey talking about from when he was in high school to where he is today. It's, I can't believe that pe not everybody's doing that. I can't believe that people would rather um, listen to some gossip on Takashi 6 9 or something. Um, than that or 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 getting caught up on the news and politics and things which is great but if you notice i'm not i stopped watching news about covid and stuff and i just went back into reading about self-development things like that you know because that's what's gonna that's gonna outlive covid there's no i'm not a journalist there's no value in me going on sharing news articles and debunking this and that and how the, the vaccine and the DNA changes and stuff. That's not for me to figure out, you know? Um, but yeah, I went on a little rant there, but I'm, right. I'm, I'm handing the mic over to Angelo. Well, you know, what's <laughs> interesting is if you read the book outliers, it okay, talks about, outliers? It, it talks about 10,000 hours and it mm. talks about successful people put in the work, right? And yeah. if you think about, you know, any craft, anything you want to be good at, you need to put in the work, right? And if you're not willing to do the work, uh, you know, then, you know, it's not going to, it's not, it's not a video game, right? Like this, this notion of, you know, oh, I can just play a video game for a few hours and mine some ore and get some gold. And, you know, now I've got this powerful sword and I can kill the dragon. Like you, you, you look at the story of Bill Gates, Right. Everyone's like, oh, Bill Gates, 50 billion dollar company. Da, da, da. Bill Gates, when he was 13 years old, was able to get his hands on a computer and he spent 1500 hours over the next seven months coding and just fiddling around with that computer. And then he spent the next 10 years and he didn't take a day off. Like He didn't take a day off for three thousand six hundred and fifty years. Or days, excuse me. Days. Years. <laughs> right? Year. For yeah. days. So yeah. 10 years in a cubicle, in front of a screen, probably never saw the sunlight, right? Didn't have a social life. He put in the work, right? And it's so funny because, you know, everybody looks around and goes, oh, you know, look at that person with a boat or that person with a Ferrari. They probably rented this. They probably rented that yeah. to show it off on Instagram. And maybe they did and maybe they didn't. But, you know how how willing are you to put in the work yes. whether it comes to personal finance whether it comes to personal health whether it comes to self-development there are so many distractions out in the universe today way more mm -hmm. way 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 more than there were 30 years ago yeah. you know when i was in high school and and we didn't have social media thank god right so yeah. you know are you willing to put in the work that's it, man. I don't know if you guys notice my my social media. Um, if I act like I'm a 20 year old, it's because I literally worked on my 20s. Always, you could go on my social media and you're gonna see 
a lot of shit posts, a lot of memes. You're not going to see pictures. You can go back in the last 10 years. There's no pictures of clubs. There's no pictures of uh, Electric Dreams. There's no pictures of, F of Fest. I was able to take, to go from minimum wage to upwards of six, fi six figures just because I sacrificed my 20s, you know, and, and, and yeah, I, I could be a lot in your face on social media because that's free. And there's and there's times where in my in my line of work, especially when it comes. OK, so here's what happened to me. I came to this country just like a lot of Latinos come here and we settle for entry level jobs. We don't think about the entrepreneurial side so that I respect that about Carlo, that he just, you know, ever since I known him. Like when, ever since the guy was like 22, 23, I can't remember. He's always worked for himself, landing contracts, yeah. right? Um, and <clears throat> and what what I've what I figured out was this: I could always keep working these jobs, you know, entry level jobs, sixteen an hour, hundred bucks a day, moving, um, delivering furniture, and this and that. Or I can, you know, spend the weekends learning. How, like how do how do you? And then I, I said to myself, let me go for a drive. Let me figure out what these people are doing. Okay, I'm 25. Let's get the idea of becoming a doctor out of the window. I, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm not going to be a lawyer. But the people that live in those neighborhoods with doctors and lawyers, what do they do? There's people with construction businesses. I'm not really good at construction. I'm not very handy like that. So what can I do? Okay, well, sales. Great. I, I, I'm, I'm good. I'm charismatic. I'm this and that and the third, but I have a language barrier. How do I master the language? You know, I have an accent that might never go away, but like, how do I go to speak in such a way that I can persuade and convince people and sell people on what I'm selling? Uh, and I spent probably, I mean, thousands of dollars in books and mentorship and things like that. And I would say about 10,000 hours probably more in, in in sales training and things like that. So then I was able to go from the minimum wage to six figures in about I, I went from 2016 until now. So that's like five years, five years. Beautiful. Uh, well, I, I, I was doing the, the good, like I was started making good money, well, decent money, but like, like two years ago, that's when I started to like, stop working by the hour start like getting commission i went from by the hour to salary to commission and that's when i realized that but it's not easy to sacrifice your 20s your weekends listen all my friends were going to the ovo fest to the electric dreams to whatever whatever i'm 31 now i can't go to those things now i feel like old you and I, never, I mean i could but like i don't feel like I, that's my jam anymore i'm over it and i never went to those things um, and, and, and it's a battle and you see it on my social media. There's times where it could be Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night, and I'm home studying, doing a master class on Chris boss or whatever. And my outlet will be the social media because it's free sometimes with my line of work. Oh, like I said, so I got into sales and, and that's a very cutthroat competitive blood sport, especially if you do what I do, which is some little bit of high, high pressure sales, um, that sort of stuff. And, and dealing with the clients, you have to be very assertive and dealing with your coworkers. You have to be very, you have to have what, what I call big dick energy. You have to have that. If you don't have, yes, you do, bro. <laughs> but you need to have like a good product or service and a way of delivering your message so that people can understand how good your product or service is. Yeah, but you need to have that, that, I don't know, in my opinion, having that confidence energy, what I call big dick energy, it's necessary. I mean, you go work at a solar sales and there's sharks, there's wolves. And if you, if you don't have that confidence, stand your ground, they're going to eat you alive. Um, and, Maybe. You know, yeah, I mean, we could agree or disagree, but like, at least in what I do, because there's, there's difference. There's a difference. There's a difference in sales. There's different kinds of products in sales. Some of them, you, you're a little bit more of providing a good service. Some of them you have to, it's like selling stocks. You have to really jam it sometimes. And, 
it is what it is, bro. And when you're in that competitive sport, you have to, it's all mindset. Right. Well, I, I want to hear from Carlo. I want to know what, um, how long have you been in business, Carlo? Uh, Carlo said, just give him a second. He's setting up. Oh, he's setting Car up. Carlo's been in business. He's been quiet for half an hour. And when I throw him a question, now he's I know. Yeah. I love it. I know. Carlo, Carlo is unpredictable, bro. Yeah. Carlo's been in business for, I don't know, since 2013. We met in 2013. So seven years? Yeah. Something like more. that. Well, Here's an interesting statistic. 90% of new businesses fail in the first year. Yeah. And of the 10% that remain, 90% don't make it to year five. Damn. So if Carlo has gone past year five and is still growing and humming along and, and doing well, he has defied the odds. He is in the 1% of business owners hmm. that have made it. Because, like I said, every year, 90% fail, and every five years, or, you know, the next four years, nine of those 10 people that are left, they fail too. So, yeah. you know, he's doing something right. You know, we don't know what it is, but, I, I, but I'll, I'll bet dollars to donuts that, A, he does the work, right? He puts in the hard work. And two, I think there are hidden factors. I think all successful people have hidden factors in the background that you never see and you don't know about, you yeah. know, whether it's late nights, you know, um, and they're, and they're dreaming or they're, or they're, they're, they're working on their business rather than in their business. Right. Because mm. there's a huge, you know, when I, when I coach advisors and, and, and clients who are business owners, I tell them there's, you, you got to work on your business. Absolutely. You got to get in the trenches with your team and do what you got to do. Right. But there's going to be time in your week, in your month, in your year, where you have to work on your business. You have to pull yourself out and ask yourself tougher questions. You know, what happens if the economy goes into the toilet? Yeah. What happens if I get sick and I can't show up and do the actual work? You know, what if, you know, what if there's an emergency in my family and I need somebody to take over for two weeks? Yeah. Right. How much am I recharging my battery or am I running on fumes? You know, a, a good friend of mine always used to say, I'd rather work 80% of the time at 100% than 100% of the time at 80%. Mm. And that's so true. You need to stop and sharpen your ax. Yeah. You need to stop and rest and, you know, get out of get out of your, your head for a little bit and, and, and do so many fun things that, uh, or do the fun things that you've been, you know, and that could just be like watching mindless TV or, playing catch with your kids or yeah. just going on a run, right? And just get your mind off it, just completely off, right? So um, I'd be curious to see some of the some of the habits that Carlos has when he's not at work and, and how much of his time does he devote to working on his business, on his craft versus in his business and in his craft? Yeah. No, I, uh, I, 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 yeah, he ain't here for that. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that over to him. From what I have seen about Carlo is he'll be installing or doing some type of renovation. Um, but Carlo is a guy who takes a lot of pride in his product and his delivery. So he, he's not the cheapest. So, which is good because he delivers, you get what you pay for with him. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, and that's one one something that I've learned that, that I noticed with him. It's the guy does not compromise cost because where he puts his name, he makes sure that the, the, the quality is there. Yeah, he doesn't split the difference. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, he's very assertive. Um, he's very, uh, you know, with his people. The um, Like I said, he... Listen, man. People, people take advantage of, of if you, you, ha, you can't, you can be nice. You can be a nice person, but you have to be a person of authority, and you have to be assertive sometimes. You have to flex a little bit. People, people take advantage, you know. And yeah, and I, I've I seen. I don't necessarily know if it, if the word flex is the right word. It just yeah. You have to have standards, right? You we have talked to. about it the last time. And if you say, listen, um, look, my dad was a plumber gas fitter his whole mm -hmm. career and uh he ran his own business yeah and uh i tell you he used to say to me every job is a pain in the butt he goes 
and it's equally proportionate. So if you are changing a client, if you're going into somebody's home and changing their toilet and you're charging them a hundred dollars, you're going to have the same amount of pain in the ass in that job yeah. as if you were changing six boilers in a condominium and you're charging $500,000. Uh -huh. He says, so you're going to have, and, and I bet you Carlos would attest to this. You're going to have the same levels of stress and you're going to have the same problems that arise. The question is, do you want to make a hundred dollars at the end of the day? Or do you want the job to pay $500,000 after six months? Yeah. And, and everyone's different, right? Some people can handle the bigger jobs and can plan it and can oversee some, a project like that. And some people are like, no, nah, man, I don't want to deal with people. I don't want to deal with staff. I don't want to deal with and rely on somebody else. I'll go in, I'll change that toilet. I'll make my hundred bucks and I'll go. And if I screw something up, whatever, I'll pay for it. Yeah. Right. So understand that in business, there's, there's going to be pain in the butt and, and stress and, and stuff's going to come up all the time. Now, what he would say to me was, there were jobs that he would price out at cost mm. because it was really slow and he just wanted to make sure he could pay his guys. He's mm. like, I didn't make any money on it, but it kept my guys employed. So when the bigger jobs did come, they were here with me and I didn't have to scramble to find people. He said, most of my jobs I priced competitively because I wanted them. And there were some jobs that I didn't want. <laughs> I did not want to deal with the people, the situation, so I would price them high, like really high. And if I got the contract, I'm like, well, you know, at least I'm getting paid well. I don't really want, like, I didn't really want it. Do you yeah. know what I'm like, I didn't really want that stress. But what I'm getting paid for it sort of compensates me for that, for the amount of stress that I'm going to go under, right? So, but my dad was forced. I mean, listen, there, there were times where it was tough. Like, you know, it's it's not it's not easy being in, in any kind of business where you've got to hunt constantly, right? I mean, look, restaurateurs have taken a huge hit over COVID. Yeah. Right? Bakeries, um, hairdressers. I mean, the list goes on at gyms. The list goes on and on where, you know, good people have, have, have given entrepreneurship a go and, um, you know, sort of COVID uh, sort of derailed, derailed some of that stuff. Right. So yeah. one of the things I, I made a video with that about that with Carlo. Uh, one of the things that he did is when this whole thing started to go down, he was like, it's applying for, for the serve and to, to get some government money and some assistance. And then I think he had like an epiphany when he was doing it. He's like, it's, I'm putting all this work into getting this handout why don't I just use that time and call every single person I've worked on in the last years, a couple of years and see, Did Hey, what can, I, what can I fix for you? What can I build for you? What can I do for you? And he got busier. Car Carlo got busier than ever. So now Carlo almost like oversees a lot of his work because he's, he's now becoming more of a business person who's landing contracts so it becomes now that the challenge is having the good people. And this is why I said flexing, but for lack of a better word, but sure. these are interesting because one of the things that I've noticed, I've never been an entrepreneur. I've been an intrapreneur because I've worked with, I've been the right hand of, of business owners. I've never gone on my own yet. Um, but uh, what I've noticed with business owners is you have your employees and every employee is a different world. Every employee is a different ego, different personality, different things. And I've, and I've been able to see how Carlo deals in kind of like water. You mold yourself, this different approaches to every one of your staff. Got to be a chameleon. You, got, you have to be a chameleon Absolutely. to see eye to eye with some of these people. A friend and, of mine, she's um, she's an executive at a, at a pharmaceutical company and they yeah. do this this testing on a regular basis, probably once a year, it's like a personality test. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they, um, they, they, they ask you a bunch of random questions and then they can um, sort of map you as a certain color, whether it's like, you know, this person leads from red, they lead from mm -hmm. yellow, they lead from green, they lead from blue. Yeah. And each of those has a different care, you know, set of characteristics. Right. So what's interesting is she said to me a few years ago when she first took the test, 
you know, she got the numbers and they were what they were. It doesn't matter. And then what she did as part of her self improvement journey is her goal was to be like for the test to come back and the numbers to be pretty even. Mm-hmm. So that way she can connect with people who lead from green. She can connect mm-hmm. with people who lead from red or yellow or, 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 or blue and just sort of recognize different tendencies. And she says, it's made me a better manager. It's made me just a better person. Like I've connected with more people and, and um, you know, more people have opened up to me and, and I've made more new friendships in the last few years than I ever have. And uh, super interesting what's, you know, what some companies are doing um, you know, when it comes to personal development. So, you know, if you're out there listening and we hope you are, uh, and, and you're still with us that, um, you know, when looking for a job and looking for, you know, if you're going to make a move or change, uh, factor in some of the intrinsic things companies can do for you factor in, you know, what sort of self-help or self-development programs do they have? Ask them, right. What do you have available as an employee of your company for, you know, improvement? Yeah. And, and they may say, we don't, you've got to do that on your own. Okay. But you know, you may, you may be looking at two jobs that maybe pay the same and have the same advancement, but you know what? The perks on one may be a little bit better than the other. And, and, you know, personal development, Hey man, those things pay dividends. They do. Dividends. You, you just gotta, like I said, you gotta put in the work. Yeah. There's a, put in the work. Um, when it comes to personal development, I've, I've noticed in my own personal experience, there's a few things that, that you need to stay on top of. Number one is knowledge and of, of, of your product or service. So if you're in mortgages, if you're in finance, you want to know, for example, what the going rates are, programs, these, that, and the third. Um, if you're in sales, you have you want to know the, the leading products in, in your, um, in your sort of industry. Um, for me, <clears throat> especially, um, one of the things I pay a lot of attention at the end of the day, everybody's a salesperson. You are always selling something. Selling. Um, yeah. And I pay attention at, at technology trend, trends because what's in the works right now, it could be so present in our lives in the next five years that I want to be ahead. So like, for example, I'm, you know, I'm very, there's like virtual reality. There is augmented reality. I, I, I'm pretty sure in the next 10 years, we're going to be walking with heads up display, all of us, you know, or maybe even sooner or maybe later. But there's a lot of things that are happening that it could be uh, like cell phones were in the, in the 80s. You know, you're like, oh, this is great, but this is just a tool. Next thing you know, 20, 30 years later, this is like we use it like six hours a day for everything, for paying everything, banking, social media, whatever, what have you. Um, so one of the things I do is I pay a lot of attention to what's happening. Who's buying what, what's merging, what's this and the other. Um, I wonder, you know what I wonder? What? I wonder the long-term effects on people's eyes. Yes. Screens, right? Like, yep. you know, if you've got good eyesight and it starts to go, is it going to go earlier? Because yeah. you're staring in front of this screen or you've got that bright light. You know, I know lots of people that say, listen, I mean, I put my I put my phone down and I pick up a book because there's no light shining in my face when I'm reading. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, who knows? Maybe, you know, today, my kids who are turning eight, 10 and 12, maybe they go and become eye doctors. And it's the most sought out profession because everyone's eyes are going are tanking. I don't know. I just, you know, just something I think about or, you know, what's interesting? you know what Amazon's working on? Well, wow. Amazon's working on the. um the possibility of delivering your package by drones. Oh yeah, yeah I've heard that. Yeah, they have, let me. Uh, yeah, keep elaborating on that. I'm gonna pull a video of what the the pilot project looks like because they have like um, it's ridiculous. But, um, but yeah, if you want to just elaborate on that, think about a world where you go onto Amazon, you go, this is what I want, and then a drone delivers it right onto your porch or yeah. in your backyard or whatever, right? So yeah. what I think of is I walk outside and I go, oh, look at all these drones zipping around. So if I'm in a big city, for example, like Toronto, mm-hmm. and you know how, I mean, we don't, we don't see the stars at night because of the pollution or whatever, you know, as much as let's say if you're up in cottage country, well, how much am I not gonna see the, the sky 
if all these thousands and thousands of drones are zipping around delivering my product or delivering our product, right? Like, yeah. you know, and then, you know, then I think that I think to myself, do we make this into a video game where everybody's got like these shotguns and they're just trying to, you know, bing, bing, it's like duck hunt, you know, and they, <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, let's, let's get these drones down, right? Let's try yeah. and smoke them. So I'm not advocating that's what we should do. I'm just, you know, it'd be kind of, kind of funny to see if, they, if that could happen. So, you know, I wonder, um, you know, we live in a world now where if I order something on Amazon, I want it tomorrow. Yeah. And if it's going to be like two weeks, I'm like, oh, two weeks. Oh, maybe we can go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Right. Think, think of that. Like, think of that, you know, that desire for immediate gratification. Yeah. Right back. You know, when I was a kid, we'd mail letters. There was no email. I got my first email address in university. Right. So we'd mail letters, whatever. Who cares? You mail your letter to your, your grandparents in Greece or something like that. And a few weeks later, you get one back. Cool. Yeah. Right. And now. You are something on Amazon. If it's like two days late, you're freaking out. You're like, this service is terrible. (laughs) Think of the world we live in. Everything comes right to your door now. You don't have to leave the house ever. Yeah. Right? So who knows what the world's going to look like in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. I mean, we've had so much technological advancement. But you know what's, what's interesting is that you know, they they say that, um, you know, the schools that my kids are at, they're saying that by the time the kids are our age, right, in their 30s and 40s, 70% of the jobs that are out there, they don't exist yet. No, and a lot of jobs today don't, didn't exist 15 years ago. Yeah, think about that. Think about how fast the world is growing. Yeah. So, you know, what's interesting is the need or the importance of, self-improvement yes having your finances in order having your house in order having your health in order is so important it's so important having your skills uh, in order your <laughs> your um, you know you can't you know it's like you have to you have to put in a little bit of work even if it's just no, being you have to put in a lot of work it's not yeah, a little bit I of do. work yeah it's a lot of work it's a lot right? of work so, yeah, you're right and again there are so many distractions out there yeah there's... And, you know, books like Outliers, books like, um, you know, um, you know, the ones you were talking about, 10X. Yeah. Um, you know, I, we never did get Carlos's list. So hopefully, you know, we'll do this <laughs> again or maybe yeah. he'll post in the comments what his, what his, his list were. Yeah. But, um, you know, what, what, what are you reading out there, right? Like, you know, here's a question for you. I was having this debate with a friend of mine yesterday and we talked about um, are we a product of our genetics or are we a product of our environment? Because I've been watching the show on Netflix called The One. And the whole premise around the show, if you haven't seen it, is that uh, with a one strand of hair, you can be de- you can be genetically matched with your perfect match. Mm. So the show now revolves around like, you know, there's a bunch of side stories, but like, you know, one woman, she sends her husband's hair in to see if she's his match. And then when she's not, she freaks out because she's like, he's going to leave me and and whatever right or this other woman she matches with somebody in spain and the the woman comes to visit with her and gets into a car crash and is now in a coma and you know she's sitting there by her bedside and feeling obligated because well she's her match right so it's, it's a really interesting it's a really interesting um concept and you know the human struggle around you know there are examples where where guys are like listen i don't care who my match is you're who i married you're who i love you're who i want to be with right i don't want to know who my match is i don't care right so you know are we a product of our environment or are we a product of our genetics right i and I, listen i think i mean there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, i don't want to use the word luck or benefit but there's a lot to say you know if you're born into a certain country into a certain you know in a certain era you know with a certain family like if your parents are loaded right chances are and it's not always the case please don't this is not a, a generalization but chances are you're going to have a better goal at life you're going to be a little more comfortable you're going to have more opportunity because you know you're not you're not scraping to eat every day right you ever uh, seen um, you ever seen the movie called white tiger no i haven't he said that uh, wealthy people are born with chances they can't afford to lose. Uh, I, I, that, I that was a that. yeah, that was a very good, I see that. <laughs> very good book. 
But you know what I like to look at is I like to look at the trend from generation to generation, right? So how many stories have you heard of, you know, immigrants coming to Canada with nothing in their pocket and they, they carve their path, they make their way. And let me tell you, my parents, your parents, you know, our grandparents, they put up with way more crap and way more hardship than we ever did and ever will. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The same should go for our kids. It should technically be a little bit easier for them just because the world evolves and, and whatever. But, you know, it, it's it's funny because they're saying that, you know, mom and dad made the money. So generation one gets wealthy on hard work, opportunity and discipline. Generation two spends that money when they inherit it. Mm -hmm. And then generation three has to rebuild it again. Mm -hmm. So if you know that is sort of, a trend that's sort of coming from a demographics perspective, how do you stop that trend? How do you now turn around and say, listen, my parents were successful. It was hard for them. Listen, my parents came to Canada. They didn't know English. Yeah. My dad would work 12 hour days and then go to English school at night, three nights a week to learn. Yeah. Right. And he still has a bit of an accent and you know, he's not, you know, first generation Canadian or whatever. Right. But, what didn't matter. Like he came with a grade three education and, and he built what he built on hard work, sweat, blood, tears. Like he did it the old fashioned way. Nothing was ever given to him. Yeah. Right. So now when, when it comes to my kids, right, how do I, and I mean, I know the answer for me personally, but like, just think about this conceptually. How do I now instill that same hard work ethic and discipline into my children who are never going to face the same hunger hunger like my my you know my dad in his in his young years teens uh, early teens and in his childhood they barely had enough to eat barely had enough to eat yeah. here like i i get you know i i give my kids grief when they don't finish what's on their plate mm -hmm. right but they're like ah, it's okay there'll be food tomorrow they don't worry about where their next meal is going to come from right mm -hmm. so what what do we do as people now you know, like we could so easily just bake in front of that TV, watching Netflix and Prime all day long and watching other people be successful and watching other people live la vida loke, right? And then what? what is that? How's that going to transcend, right? So, yeah, listen, you want to watch some TV, you want to go, go to the movies, you want to watch sporting events, no problem. Have, you know, fill your boots, but balance, right? How, how do we, you know, what's out there as far as personal development and how much do you put into yourself you know one run, one great quote that i heard a couple years ago is that average people save and rich people earn mm. right i love that quote i yeah. do you know because yeah. if you're if you're in a job where you get a salary no matter how much you, how good you do at your job right that's it like you're you're you're, you're stuck with that in, not necessarily settling because there are some people that make some good incomes or they love what they do so True. you know no judgment here but you know, if you make 60,000 a year and that's, you make five grand a month and that's what you make and there's no opportunity to make more, right? If you want, you know, more out of life from a financial perspective, well, you know, what can you do, right? Do you just kind of go, oh, well, this is it for me? Yeah. Turn on the, you know, let's see how the Leafs are doing. Or do you, as you said the last time, get another job or, or do some, some, some reading or just be better with your money? Yeah. Right. So it's uh it's an interesting world we live in and and um yeah, I don't know. If if I would have told my dad at sixteen I'm gonna stay home all day and play The Legend of Zelda and then put a camera behind me and stream it live on YouTube, he'd have been like, Are you kidding me? I'm gonna take that thing away from you and get your butt back to school. Okay, so let me ask you this question about genetics and product of our environment. What if your if your dad was born today? Do you think he'll be dreaming about being a professional gamer uh, by the age of ten, or do you think he's? It, How he I'd be... love to be a professional gamer. Never <laughs> like, do you? Forties. Do you think uh, like our genetics are evolving to the point where kids are born more tech savvy? Or if you think if you parachute somebody from the 70s and or 60s and you put them in, in today's environment, you think, you know, given all the opportunity, same time that we've had with technology, you think they'll be as tech savvy? Like, so, do you so here's what I'll say to that. Here's how I'll answer your question. You know, when I um, when I was in university and finishing up my dad would say to me he'd be like it's so easy for you kids today you have everything 
You yeah. have everything. It's so easy. It was so hard for me. And I'd be like, you know, Dad, you're not wrong. It is a lot easier today for teens, people in their 20s. I'll give you that. I said, but I'll tell you what. When you came to Canada in the 60s, yeah. you had a job the next day. Yeah. Today, there are people that go through university four, five, six years. They graduate and there are no jobs. And it's not because they're lazy and they're, you know, they want to play Call of Duty in their basement, you know, for four hours, six hours, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. It's because there are no jobs out there yeah. for them. Yeah. So, and there's two reasons. One, uh, demographically, the boomers are a huge demographic and they're still working. Now they're 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 yeah. they're getting there, right? That bottom end of the, the boomers are now starting to retire. Yeah. But they're still working and they're still clogging up the system, right? Like, mm. you know, a nurse at a hospital who's 65 years old makes 90 grand a year. Yeah. And she looks and goes, I can't retire. I haven't saved. I haven't this. I haven't that. I gotta keep working. If she would retire, the hospital could hire three nurses in their mid-20s at 30 grand a year. Mm. knowing that one out of three will make it to 65 in the career, right? Mm. So now you could triple your, your, your people power or your workforce output mm -hmm. if the people would just retire, but they, yeah. but they can't because financially they, they don't have the scratch to do it. They haven't planned or, or whatever, right? So we have, we have a small issue and it's not that small, but we have an issue that our young can't find work because our old won't retire. Yeah. Right? And couple that with ever-changing technology yeah right like think of think of 30 years ago it wasn't uncommon for somebody to retire after working 30 years in a factory yeah nothing wrong with that work noble hard-working people now people what are the chances you work 30 years in a factory chances are a robot's going to figure out how to do it and they're going to lay you off and now mm -hmm. you're like okay now what do i do Right. So with technology changing as quickly as it is and the job market changing, you got to ask yourself, how can I set myself or my kids up for success in the future? Right. Sales is a is a definitely a, a huge skill that I don't think nearly enough people know. Yeah. Right. 16 years old, you should be knocking on, on doors selling Girl Guide cookies or magazine subscriptions or, you know, I mean, whatever the equivalent of that is, right? You should know what it's like to, to close a big sale, to lose a big sale, customer service, people. It's, it's all people skills. People skills, which is not, right? it's not something that's going to go away. I mean, at the end no. of the day, you could have chatbots, you could have a lot of things, but the human interaction, uh, that's not going to, that's not going to go away. Now, I wanted to bring up a point here um, because w I'm, I'm catching myself doing this sometimes and I have to like give myself, you know, like, woke, what are you doing? Right? Like I, the, the Gen Z's and the millennials problems are valid. There's the reasons to be stressed out and anxious are valid. I just can't understand some of it. You know, I, I'm not a TikTok guy. I'm not a gamer, streamer, whatever. So I, I can't understand why they could be stressed about, but I'm not going to discredit and say, you have nothing to stress about. You have no. You have it so easy, and I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that yes, they have it easy, easy to live, easy to survive. It's easier right now than ever to stay alive and stay healthy. That's mm -hmm. it. But it's not easy when you start your adulthood with an OSAP loan of thirty thousand dollars, in or your, fifty or fifty or a hundred. Because I'll tell you this. Not everybody that takes an OSAP loan loan finishes the course, but everybody has to pay it back. 100% of people has to pay it back. Well, you know so, what? A bunch of conversations I've been having with my friends that have kids is, do all kids need to go to university? Yeah. Right? Like growing up, you know, my parents like, you're going to go to school. You're going to get an education. You're going to be a professional. Rah, 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 rah. Okay. No problem. But, you know, how many people finish with a bachelor of whatever and don't end up in their field. Now, I'm not saying there's no value in the education. Please don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the wisest things I ever heard was from a, a classmate in university when I asked him, you know, what, what is it about this subject that interests you? And like, why are you getting this degree? And he said to me, because it's easier to carry than a piano. And he goes, listen, I don't expect to get a job in my field. There's no field for what I'm studying. But the 
the the self discipline and the 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 understanding to say, hey, I did this, I achieved this, I accomplished this, to, to him was more than enough to uh, to justify that cost. But there are a lot of people that don't don't need to be going to university mm-hmm. when they finish high school, right? Go <clears throat> go start your career, start to start carving out your legacy. And if it's if it's sales, if it's entrepreneurship, if it's working at a company in the you know look at look at Gord Ash, who was the GM of the Blue Jays in the '90s. The guy started selling tickets in the window. He started selling tickets and just moved his way up the ladder. It's That's like amazing. Um, what a great story. It's like the Longos the Longos brothers story. It's pretty uh, guys. The guys were selling tomatoes and homegrown vegetables out of a, out of the trunk of the car. It, if you look at Longos, it's uh, it's 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 up there, bro. It's up there. You know, it's one of the biggest grocery chains in uh, in the gta um I, and i was always impressed by the the longos brothers story i think it was fascinating but yeah getting back to that point of so yeah so kids these days yeah like it was harder in the sense that you know your body you had to put in more sweat to to get some things back in the day for for your personal life but it became now so that it's easier to stay alive because we have it all we have i mean you could have everything delivered to you you could have it all so in that regard it's easy but in the regard of you know like you say your your dad came here and the next day he had a job and and he wasn't looking at real estate prices of 500,000 and stuff like that and the and the bills were a lot less he didn't have your dad never had a 180 dollar a month cell phone bill he didn't have the netflix amazon prime blah 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 blah, blah bills so all of those bills services that we are that are necessary to have now that didn't exist back Look, in the in day the, in the seventies, you could fill your fridge with $5 a week. Yeah. But you so, can make 200 bucks. Yeah. Right. Today you make 200 bucks. It's going to cost you 200 bucks to fill your fridge. Yeah. So yes, I, I'll concede. Look, I'll concede that, you know, inflation's gotten out of control. Cost of living's gotten out of control. You know, incomes have not, you know, have, have not come in, 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 uh, in line with that for sure it's a lot more expensive to yeah. live today than it did than it was back then but you're right there's not all these added costs you don't have your cell phone bill your ipad bill you don't have all these streaming services no internet bill like mm-hmm. we had a phone on the wall with a long cord yep. like and it was probably like 25 bucks a week or uh, a car insurance back. was a quarter of what it is now um, yeah, all, all these little things but populations are bigger yep. there's more cars on the road there's more accidents there's more terrible drivers so you know. So yeah, so that argument that oh the kids have it easy, they, yes and no. I mean they have it easy for some things, but they don't have it easy to buy. It was easier for so. So if I get a if I get a boomer telling me yeah you have it so easy, yeah I have it easy to stay alive and 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 and, and get whatever I want on the internet. Sure. But how easy it is for me to buy a house right now where I'm I I get I get out of my twenty I get out of my teen years with a fifty thousand dollar OSAP loan and the, in in an apartment in Toronto is five hundred thousand. For okay, one bedroom plus time, time out, time out, time out. Let's back the truck up a little bit. When my dad bought his first house in 1972, yeah, it was $60,000. Exactly. Okay, now, but hang on, hang on, just time out, okay? But when he bought that house, he bought that house at like Don Mills and Steele's area in Toronto. Yeah. North of York Mills, there was nothing. There was nothing. It was far. It was nothing. Zero. Nothing. Yeah. So when he bought that at first, and he tells me the story vivid, and, and I remember it. He said to me, the first time I looked at the house, it was actually 50000 And I turned it down. I said, no. I said, I'm not driving all the way up there from, I think my parents were at like St. Clair and Bathurst or something like that in a little apartment. I'm not driving all the way up there just to drive all the way back down. Right? Then six months later, he bought the house. It was $10,000 more. And he's like, ah, I should have bought it. It's probably like two million ago. right now. <laughs> but, so, but hold on. So let's talk about that in relative terms. Yes, you can't get a house in Toronto because my dad couldn't get a house in Toronto in the 70s. Mm. They were too expensive. But he could get a house a little bit north yeah. where it wasn't developed. So how many people now are going to Keswick or Barrie or Manitick. Aurelia or Alston and saying, yeah. well. Woodstock. Right? <laughs> or going east or west or, or whatever. Yeah. Welland. Or, so, so. You know, so that's number one is, yes, I understand 
But you know, what what do you think an apartment in downtown Toronto is gonna cost you? Like yeah. a three bedroom. Come on, you're in downtown million. Toronto. Right? Over a million, yeah. Easily, if not two. But here's the interesting thing, too. I don't believe, and this is just a personal opinion, I don't believe real estate in Toronto has caught up to the rest of the world. So I'm gonna give you an example. Mm-hmm. Let's say we buy a 2,000 square foot, three bedroom apartment in downtown Toronto. Let's say it's $2 million, which is outrageous, right? What do you think that same apartment would go in downtown Manhattan, downtown LA, London, Tokyo, Rome? Wow. Yeah, right? you're right. Chicago, Miami. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Two, two million in Toronto in Canadian dollars? I'm in if I had the money, yeah. right? Because I don't think Toronto's caught up with the rest of the world. We're getting there. But what but about Manhattan? But like, what about? See, that's one. So in the luxury end, yeah, it hasn't caught up. But then you look at all these people that have whatever the house, the eight hundred thousand dollar house in Woodbridge, and they're like, "Huh, let's look at what we can get for eight hundred thousand in Florida. Fuck, we can get the house three times as much." Yeah. So in the luxury part, it didn't caught up. But then if you go to if you go to uh, Orlando or Kissimmee, Florida or Miami, you see a lot of Ontario plates. Because yeah, man, but they, they live an hour outside of Orlando, or yeah, they live an hour outside of Miami, they don't live in downtown. But you don't see $150,000 bangalows here in, in like Mississauga or Brampton, no, of course not. So you see that in Florida, so it's like a weird, but not in downtown Florida, no, but not then the, not in the Mecca in the center, yeah. yeah but then the those thing. prices they're higher than us, so it's weird. Here's the thing, and here's the psychology around it. Here's the problem when my dad came to Canada in the 60s. He had a suitcase, mm-hmm. right? With a couple things and a couple dollars in his pocket. Mm-hmm. And he lived in a crappy one bedroom apartment that he was able to get. And then when he got married with my mom, they lived in a crappy little two bed, you know, one bedroom apartment at St. Clair and Bathurst, right? And then they bought their modest little house. It was a back split, semi detached, not a big backyard. Not a big driveway, not a big house, but you know, it had enough bedrooms for all of us. So that was good. Right. And then they moved to the family home 15 years after they got married. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when I grew up, I took my stuff in my suitcases and I walked out the door. Mm -hmm. So me walking out the door of my parents, beautiful home that I grew up in, you know, halfway through my through my, my life at the time, because I we moved when I was nine into the, the matrimonial home, the big home. Then what happens is I go out and now I go look for an apartment or I go look for a condo. Do you know what the, the problem is? Is that when you're used to a certain level of luxury, okay? And I'll use me as an example, but I'm talking conceptually and generally. It's like, oh, I'm not going to go live in a crappy little apartment in a crappy area of town. Why would I leave my parents comfortable house that maybe has a pool and a jacuzzi and cable TV and mom does my laundry to go live in a crummy little apartment. Right? So what happens is sometimes, and I'm not saying everyone's like this, but the mentality is people are walking out of mom and dad's house and then they want to go buy a house that's like mom and dad's house. But don't remember the fact that, Mom and dad lived in the crappy apartment first, then bought the little house. And then after 15 years of marriage and saving and building and scraping and building their practices, then they went and bought the big house. We in our 20s want the big house now with the pool and the jacuzzi because that's what we're used to. So you got to understand too that, listen, while I completely understand that it's not as easy to get into the real estate market today, People's expectations of what they're entitled to or what they should be in is also really high in yeah, some cases. Your parents, so, your, your parents, um, they they came from a different world. They came from a different like uh, generation. And that, totally. that was a that was a generation that it was engraved in their in their mindset that 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 you have to run a marathon. Life is a marathon. And yeah. I guess because there wasn't social media or anything. They didn't have the microwave mindset that we have today right you know what i mean like 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 realistically you work your whole life you get your nice house and then you buy the maserati right because you're retired you're treating yourself but people sure. now 
They're 25 20, and they want the Maserati. They're 25. They got a good paycheck and they take that and they get approved for a Maserati. But right. it's like, and the next thing you know, you're, you're getting, he, he, we talked about a whole being in the, in the dead vicious cycle. Right. Um, and, 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 and that's what's lacking today is, is the, the, the ability to de delay pleasure and to think like a marathon, to, to be okay with running a marathon. Yeah. I have a friend of mine, she's 25. Um, and she came to me for some advice uh, about real estate, you know, financials. And we did some, some work. And what she ended up doing is she bought a condo in Mississauga yeah. and stayed living at home and rented out the condo. And she's like, you know what? She's like, mom and dad are okay with me living at home. You know, I pitch in whatever. I'm not like, it's not a bad environment for me to be in. And uh, I'm going to go instead of, you know, buying a nice sports car or spending my money on like tons of crazy clothes or whatever. I'm going to go buy a condo. I'm going to stretch myself a little bit thinner and I'm going to stay home a little bit more. And, um, you know, three years later, she's had somebody rent from her. You know, she's building that equity. The price of the, the, the price of her, the value of her condo has gone up. Hmm. You no, know, she's in a relationship which she's really happy with. And if, you know what, if, if she and her boyfriend get married, they got a place that they can go if they want that, or she can just keep it. And then they, you know, and it becomes an asset and a source of income for her, right? Yeah. How many people in their 20s are doing stuff like that? I mean, you would know better than me because people come to you for loans and mortgages and stuff like that, right? So, you know, it, it's it's a mindset. It's a, it's a, she's driven. She's ambitious. She's like, I'm not just going to go through the machine and wait around and then, you know, not be able to get into the real estate market or whatever. I'm going to stretch myself a little bit and, and keep working on my craft. And uh, listen, in three years, she's done very, very well for herself from where she was to, you know, when she finished school to where she is just three years later. But like, I, like you said, she doesn't go out and party all the time and she doesn't travel here. There 30 countries by 30 and any of this crap. She's, she's working hard, right? Like, 30 countries by right? 30. I mean, Right. Yeah. Some people can do it. Some people can't. And listen, some people will do it now and won't be able to later. And some people won't do it now and they'll do a ton later. Mm. Right. So again, it's, it's opportunity is out there. That's, that's what I talk about. Dave Ramsey a lot. Cause Dave Ramsey says, you know, what does he say? Oh, fuck. I forgot his quote. Um, if you, if you do what my, okay, let me get back to up. you. Yeah, Just let me look it up. up. It'll come to you. Don't worry. It'll let come me to look you. it up. Dave Ramsey. Right. Um. Yeah. And it all <laughs> and it all loops back. It all loops back to what are you doing with your free time, right? I saw a great quote the other day that said, "Don't don't mistake my free time for my availability." Mm. Just because you have free time doesn't mean you're available, right? Because how much of your free time are you using? to get into the gym and build a better body? How much of your free time are you using to read or, or listen to podcasts or listen to yeah. audio books to better your yourself? And listen, not everybody's gonna read books on finances or self-help or like, but what what are you interested in, right? Yeah. What, what, what are some things that you can do, little things, and again, start small. You know, I'm a big advocate of that. Start small and, you know, maybe you fall into something that you get really interested in and there you go. So um, the, the quote was, if you live like nobody else now, you can leave like nobody else later. And that's, um, that's, one, of the th that's one of the things that, that, that I noticed with my generation and, and is, the, is the lack of ability of delaying pleasure. I'm guilty of that myself. Uh, I'm guilty of trying to impress people I don't know with money that I don't have. Right. Um, that is one of the things that you know what that, that we need to work on. That's a great quote. Actually, my uh, my really good friend Bob Geniak wrote a book called "Rich Is a State of Mind." Mm. That's an excellent book on you know just being a he he wrote it as a client of a, of a financial advisor. He's like, I'm not an advisor. I'm not in the industry. I'm a client, and here's mm. my experience. And one of the quotes he says when he gives his, his talks is, you know, stop. Stop spending money you don't have on things you don't need to impress people you don't like. Yeah. Right. And I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll send you a link for him and you can throw it in the description and we'll give him some love. But um, absolutely, absolutely a great, uh, great quote because I think gone are the days where 
you need the big house, the fancy car, the, the, you know, the $40,000 watch or the, to be like, look at me. It's like, nobody cares. Nobody yeah. cares. Right. At the end of the day, have you shorn up the back end? Are you spending less than you make? Are you putting the work in so that you can live a long, healthy life and you're not just scraping by and surviving? Right. So my, um, sorry, I got about 10 minutes, but I wanted to talk about this. I wanted to talk about um, the future of, of jobs and how important it is for us to, to have, you know, our skills sharpen and, and just to assess technology trends and things and things that are changing in your industry. And I think the way things are going, we are heading into an individual employment in a gig. Uh, we're going to work by gigs, for example, um, that sort of that sort of uh, work model is going to be more prominent. You know, you're going to get paid longer. But first of all, right now, the the whole going to the office and saying working from home is is, is a big change. COVID has made that a, a, a regular best practice now. If you don't have to go to the office, don't go to the office. It's been proven that we can get just as much done if we if we do some of the stuff from more. home. If not more. If not more. Because think about think about the people that drive two hours to get to work every day. Correct. Two hours to get home and they're sitting in traffic frustrated because they hate driving or there's traffic. Like, dude, I hate driving downtown Toronto. Exactly. I will avoid it like the plague. I will much rather either take an Uber, let someone else drive, or hop on the subway, mm -hmm. right? And just walk. But not everybody has that luxury. So that's that's number one. Um the other thing too is I think COVID really, they, they really advanced a lot of things. And, and I'll give you an, an industry example. You know, um, if you want to buy a house today, or if you wanted to buy a house a year or two years ago, your real estate agent could send you all the documentation over the phone with DocuSign. And on your phone, you could go, Doo -doo -doo -doo, done. You didn't have to go to the office and sign documents and get in your car and all this BS. Yeah. You just send it to your phone. You go, doo -doo -doo, and you own the house, right? Well, in the insurance business, we had to be face-to-face -face with the client live, right? Mm. We could not do applications over the phone, over email, over you know Zoom or, or FaceTime or whatever. Couldn't do it. And then COVID, and, and they would say, oh, the technology is like five years away. It would be a big investment for us. We're not willing to do it. We don't think it's important, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, then COVID hit. Guess what? It took six to eight weeks, and every insurance company had it, uh, had the ability to, um, to give their advisors a chance, or their agents, uh, a way to write up policies without being face-to-face. -face. Like yeah. that. Like, it was literally like, they were pushed into a corner and they said, if sometimes that's what this, it takes. Yeah. If we don't do this, we're done. If we you don't evolve, you evaporate. Right. So it's just, it's interesting how, you know, how many, how many people are like, Oh, come into the office. Like even with, even when I bought my house a year ago, uh, I had a guy the you know, the guy that I worked with to help get my mortgage. I don't even know what he looks like. We talked yeah. on the phone. We went through email. I signed all my documentations electronically. But I never went, I never got dragged into the office. And you know what the beauty of that is? Is you could live anywhere now. You that's, got, that's what you they, got that's choice. That's what they call the new rich. The new right? rich like, is I don't somebody to, who can live anywhere. I don't need to live in Toronto oh. and do my job. I could live in, like, I, I know people that have moved out east or have gone down to Niagara or have gone whatever. And they're like, why would I live in Toronto and do that? Why would I yeah. pay exorbitant amount for property tax and for a house and I could sell my house in Toronto, move to Nova Scotia, new, move to New Brunswick, move to Saskatchewan, whatever, like wherever you want to go. Right. Yeah. And you know, I get, I could, I can listen. I had a client retired, not retired, but he was on route to retirement and he said, I'm going to give it two more years and then I'm going to sell the house and move to the cottage and live there full time. Well, guess what? When COVID hit, he sold the house and moved to the cottage and he's been working from there. He just retired. And he's like, yeah. this is great. Like well, I should have done this years ago. Right. But we didn't know as a society and as a culture that we could, um, that we could make this work. People always thought, well, the old way of doing things is come to the office. Like even look at schools. 
Yeah. Right. And on the online learning. Now I've said, you know, I, I had a good friend of mine who had a really great idea in the summer. He said, why don't have a channel on TV that's like the grade one channel? So if you're a kid in Ontario, you tune into channel, you know, 701 on Rogers or 701 on Bell or whatever, whatever service you use. And you can watch a teacher or a group of teachers teach the grade one curriculum. The kids can do their homework, send it in via email, right? Or Seesaw or whatever they use. And there's a team of teachers behind the scene that's marking everything. So now guess what? There's no such thing as a sick day. If my kid says to me, oh, I don't really feel that well. I don't want to go to school. No problem. Just flip open the computer and you can do your learning from home. Yeah. Right? I bet you there are a lot less sick days or there'd be a lot less sick days. If that snow was days. Day, right? <laughs> so, yeah, like snow days. It's a snow day. Hey, man, look snow at what happened in means, court. court. Snow day court. just means everybody's online. <laughs> That's all that means. Dude, right? If you go to court now, you talk to the judge on Zoom. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, it's, 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 it's very interesting, and I'm very curious to see what the world's going to look like once COVID, we've got a handle on COVID, and it's you know people are vaccinated and they've opened up again. The post-COVID is going to be uh, interesting. I'm not convinced that everybody's just going to go back to the office. Like everybody will go back to the Scotiabank Arena and the Sky Dome to watch sports, no problem. I, yeah. I get that, but I, I'm not convinced everybody's going to go flying back to the office, and I'm not convinced that um, people are going to want to put that drive in. And and, with, and the companies keeping all that expensive uh, um, industrial real estate where what do you need it for what 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 do I need to pay sixty thousand dollars for this building where all you guys work from home and made made the company just as much yeah so we're yep. gonna get we're gonna get a, an incubator a share I work the work share spaces are gonna be very big in the future you know like what we're gonna do is we're gonna sell the building that we have yeah. to a developer who's gonna build more homes. Perfect. On that right. note, bro, if you could give me your final thoughts, I have 5% on my laptop right now. <laughs> well, my final thoughts are number one, you should get a plug for your phone <laughs> or for your laptop. Uh, but you listen, um, there are some great books out there. There are some great, and with audiobooks, audiobooks have changed the way we learn. 100%. Uh, you can be in the car, you can be on a run, you can be on the elliptical, and you could be learning while you're doing, you know, you could be cleaning your house and, and, and listening on your headphones as you're as you're doing what you're doing, right? And I would encourage everybody, you know, pick up a book, read, learn, audiobook. I'm not a big reader, but I'm a big listener. I love to listen, and I will happily put on a a, a headset and and do my thing and, and listen, right? So, and uh, also, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. There's there's a lot of books on finance that I've read where there's some good stuff in there, and there's some stuff that I would never recommend. Cause it's, it's way out there. It's just, yeah. it's wrong or it's, it's, you know, so just, you know, I've seen so many people, they, they read a book and then they go, Oh, I'm completely changing my life now. Listen, you, you can't, you can't run your life like a little speedboat where you make all these twists and turns. Yeah. You, your, your life is like, like a big ship, right? Like you got to go slow and make small changes to your development and your improvement. But listen, if you watch, you know, three hours of TV a day, maybe watch two and listen to an audio book for an hour, right? Yeah. Just reroute some of that time. Right? 100%, 100%. Take advantage. Outliers, one of my favorite books. Freakonomics, Outliers. one of my favorite books. Uh, Never Split the Difference, one of my absolute favorites. I'm reading that one for sure. Listening to, and the one, the last one I want to recommend is called Six Months to Six Figures. There's one really good note on there, which is turn your car into university. With uh, between audiobooks, podcasts, and everything, if you're driving an hour on the 401, do you, I mean, five hours a day or of music that you've heard a million times, or five hours a day of top knowledge? I mean, the, the stuff on Audible right now, it's almost like, wow, I can't believe people don't listen to this. I can't believe you're better. You're listening to Call Her Daddy and you're not listening to this. Like, this is crazy. Uh, I would say, <laughs> listen. I would say two and a half hours of listening to music and two and a half hours of listening. Yeah, to in moderation. <laughs> in moderation, right? You don't again. You don't want an extreme. You got, but you got a balance, right? You got to listen yeah. to some cool tunes, and sometimes you just want to unwind and and you know put the windows down. Now the weather's getting better. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, absolutely, if you're in the car three four hours a day, 
use some of that time, right? Your car is your, your car is your university. Yeah. So but on that note, work, bro. And if you work from home, right, the hour before your day and the hour after your day, which is when you should have been in your car, use that time wisely. Yeah, learning, mm -hmm. learning. I've been, uh, I've been, I put my headset on in the morning. I, I uh, and I clean my house, get up early, get up for the day, and I already have one hour of, of, you know, learning sales tactics, learning how to deal with rebuttals, learning how to pitch this and that and the third. It's crazy, bro. Like, the the opportunities there. We have the same the same amount of time as as Oprah and, and and Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and everything. So. It's no excuse. I use it. Absolutely. Well, listen, thanks for having me. Don't forget thanks behind, for coming the dot, behind the vault dot net, or you can go to YouTube slash behind the vault. Uh, we've got some great content that we've been putting up. Uh, I some love it. Clips from the videos we've been doing as well here. So uh, if you have any questions about your financial future, if you want to just get a little bit better and you want some advice, head on over. We'll happily help you. There you go. On that note, guys, thank you so much. Stay tuned for more. All right. Take it easy. <laughs> Peace out. Bye bye. So dark, can't see a thing. I hear some of the broken beat. Give me nickel, give me dime, give me doll, I'll give you a smile. Ah, so dark, can't see a thing on the corner of the street.